God's placed us. Today I want to share a message and we're still on the What If series. Uh, and just from the wave of me, if you've been blessed by this What If series, as God has been speaking to you and God has been just reminding you and changing you and challenging you. Well, today I want to share a message again from the What If series. And today's message is called The Truth Will Set You Free. The Truth Will Set You Free. There's a movie in Hollywood, the movie's called There's a, a Few Good Men. Two main actors in this movie, Tom Cruise and um, uh, Jack Nicholson. There's a certain line in this movie where Tom Cruise is inquiring about something that happened. This is a kind of military film. He's inquiring about something that happened to an individual. And he says, I want the truth. And Jack Nicholson turns around and says to him, you can't handle the truth. Well, I wonder if this afternoon if we can handle the truth. Look at your neighbor and see, can you handle the truth? <laughs> well, we'll see. John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, any believers in the house, any believers watching online today, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth. And the truth will. Doesn't say might. Doesn't say could do. Doesn't say maybe. It says the truth will set you free. Before I pray and ask for the ministry of the Holy Spirit to anoint me for this afternoon. Would you just take a moment and think of one thing that you want God to break you free from? Would you be specific this afternoon like a sniper? You know, sometimes when we ask for freedom, we're a bit like somebody with a news aid. It's all over the place. <laughs> oh, here, 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 here. But today I want to encourage you to be a sniper. Focus in on one thing that you desire to be broken free from today. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the scriptures. We thank you for the promise of freedom. We've sang about freedom. We've danced about freedom. We've sang about a thousand hallelujahs. And we've praised you, Lord, with the voice of a mighty choir in this place. And so, God, today we come with the same expectation and the same excitement about your word. The Lord, your, your word would speak to us. The living word would speak to us. That God, as your word says, my God, that it is sharper than a double-edged sword. That it pierces to the dividing of soul and spirit and bone and marrow. That is a discerner of the intents of the hearts of man and woman. The Lord, that your word would go forth and do exactly as it's sent forward to do. The scriptures say your word does not come back void. And so we ask you today that every heart be open, Lord. Every mind be open. I ask you, God, that we would place every preconceived idea, every limitation. God, hear me, hear me, someone, that you would place every other failed attempt on the altar right now. And that you would believe that change is possible through Jesus Christ our Lord. Somebody say amen. 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 So, the truth will set you free. As we continue on in this what I've series, I use John 8 32 as the opening scripture to set the, set the direction, to set the, the foundation of where it is that we're going. But this afternoon, I invite you to join me to turn your Bible to the book of Romans, chapter 8. The book of Romans chapter 8, I invite you to open up your Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 8, verse number 1. We're going to be reading from arguably one of the most powerful chapters and arguably one of the most powerful books in all of Scripture. The book of Romans. Today I promise you that I'm going to give you some things to think about. But I also promise you, you know me, I'm going to give you some things to share with them. Because scripture might cut, but it also heals. 
and makes separate, but also joins back together. And so I promise you that I'm going to give you some good content today. Content that's not just going to tickle your ears and make you feel better for today, but content that's going to set you free forever. God, I don't know about you, but that excites me. Are you ready? Oh, come on, that's poor. Are you ready? Yes. Come on, are you ready left side? Yes. Come on, are you ready right side? Yes. Come on, I think the right side's louder than right. Right side, are you ready? Yes. Right side, are you ready? Yes. Come on, the right side's ready. Yes. Romans chapter 8. Online, are you ready? <laughs> Thank you for whoever said that to surround me. <laughs> Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 4. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus and because you belong to him the power of the life giving spirit please listen I know you've maybe heard these verses before but I'm asking you to hear them with an open heart and a fresh word today and because you belong to him the power of the life giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end. Wow. I don't know if I'm in the right church today. Maybe, maybe, maybe you guys never need a coffee or something this <laughs> afternoon. A bit warm, maybe open a window or something in here. You know I like a lot of amen. Come on, I, I, this excites me here. And in that body, God declared an end yes. to sin's control over us yes. by giving us his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature Yes. But instead, follow the spirit. Amen. I feel like I need pray again, man. <laughs> Ooh, do me a favor, man. Look at your neighbor. Come on, look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, say, I'm free. I'm free. You see, some of you aren't saying it loud because you don't believe it. Because being free is not a feeling. Being free isn't how you wake up in the morning and look in the mirror. Being free has nothing to do with your job, your bank balance, or your haircut. <laughs> Being free has nothing to do with what you look like, what you feel like, what your body may say. Freedom in Christ has nothing to do with what you think. Yeah. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, I'm free. I'm free. Come on, somebody needs to declare that today. I'm See, I'm free. free. I'm free. At the heart of the gospel. The heart of our faith is in the belief that God can change anyone. Amen. It doesn't matter who you are, yeah. where you've been, who you're running with, how long you've been doing it. It doesn't matter how many times you've done it, how many times you've failed. The power and the central fact that the heart of the gospel and the heart of our faith is that in Jesus Christ you can be free. That God's power of the cross of the Calvary yeah. can free anyone. It doesn't matter where you are, what you've done, the truth of the scripture is. Yeah. Where the convincing and convicting power of the Holy Spirit is, there can be freedom. Yeah. My God, I feel like I'm going to preach on this place today. Glory. Yeah. Huh. God can change anyone. He can change the hardness of sinners. He can turn around the harlot. He can turn around the drug addict. He can turn around the depressed. He can turn around those who are single. He can turn those that have made so many mistakes. He can change anyone. And if you read your Bible, which I hope you do, you'll see glaring evidence of God and the miracle working power of the Holy Spirit through the lives of David through the lives of Jacob, through the lives of Peter. But there's also one in the Bible, and we know this story, he's a person in the Bible that only him outside of Jesus 
had done more for the church than any other man in the Bible. His name, of course, was Saul or Paul. Paul's story is such a story of personal transformation that this encounter with Jesus changes his whole life. Saul or Paul, his old past, his BC days, whatever, is a glaring example and evidence and a portrait of a man who is walking one way and an encounter with Jesus ends up turning the other way. He's an example that God can change anyone. And a matter of fact, if you haven't read the scriptures, all you need to do is maybe just take a look at the person sitting next to you on the chair. That you may be thinking, man, God can't change anyone. God can't change me. I want to just remind you. Look at the person next to you on the chair and say, has God changed you? I said, I want you to look at them again. I want you to look at them again. And again. I, want you, I want you to look at them again and say, listen, you don't know where he's brought me from. Uh, I said, tell that name again. He said, listen, the reason I pray is so much is because God has done so much in my life. And listen, I've got a sneaky suspicion and a, and a funny feeling that there's someone in this place today that can testify that if I had not been for the grace of God upon their life, they would not be sitting here this afternoon. Let, let me just pause and take a minute. Let me just take a pastoral survey. Is there anybody in this place that knows if I had not been for the grace of God, you would not be sitting here. If I had not been for the grace of God, you would not be in your right mind. If I had not been for the grace of God. Is there anybody that can raise a hand and testify and say, he's changed me. Oh, listen, listen, I know you're struggling to put your hand up because you're thinking, well, I'm, I may not be perfect yet. Uh, I still got things, I, I haven't given everything up yet. I, I still cuss every now and again. Hello. <laughs> I know I may not walk in righteousness all the time. But if you just knew where the Lord has brought me from, if I could just testify for a minute what God has changed in my life. Yeah, I still look rough and maybe I bark sometimes and maybe I look like I've been dragged through Tesco's backwards on a Saturday night. But listen, if you knew what God has changed in our lives. I don't know, is there anybody on the left hand side here that can just wave a hand and testify and say, God's been good to me. Come on, maybe on the right hand side is God has been good to me. Listen, maybe I'll talk to you online this afternoon. I don't know where you are, what you're doing, what God is up to in your life. But I want to encourage you and remind you today that he is in the business of changing broken lives. You see, listen, maybe you're seen already, Pastor. I've got my sermon. I'm done. Just call the old call right now. Because maybe you come in this place and you're watching online and you just needed reminded. You just needed to hear that at the heart of the gospel, at the heart of the story, in the heart of Jesus, is that nothing is impossible for those who believe that with God, nothing is impossible. I came just to remind you this afternoon in Victory Weeks Glasgow in our 3 p.m. service that you can change, that you don't have to do what you've always done. You don't have to be what you've always been. You don't have to rehearse and repeat mistakes. Amen. Yes, God. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I'm fed up rehearsing and repeating mistakes. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yes. But by the power of Jesus Christ, you can change anything in your life. There's nothing so stuck. There's nothing so difficult that God cannot break right here and right now if your desire is to change. But here's what I need you to hear today. Have you ever got to a place? Have you ever got to a place when you fail to believe that change is possible? Have you ever got to a place in your life because of so many failures or so many attempts, so many repeats, like replaying an old episode of EastEnders over and over and over and over and over again? You know what's coming next because you know what lines up to it. It's repeated and it's rehearsed and it goes over and over. But what the enemy does is the enemy tries to convince us that even when we say that we're going to change, 
The enemy tries to convince us, even when we are convicted and even when we are committed to making the change, because we've failed so many times before, that we lose the belief in our ability for to change and God's ability to change us because we've repeated the same mistake over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, maybe you're sitting here today thinking, Pastor, you're speaking to me. I've rehearsed, I've repeated, I've done it continually. And somewhere inside of me, I've trust God. And somewhere inside of me, I know he's able, but the devil's been lying to me. And he's been telling me, brother, you're always going to stay that way. Sister, you're never going to get free. Mister, you're always going to be bound. Child, you're always going to be lonely. This one and that one, it's never going to work out. But I came to tell you today. Change is possible. Change is possible. And once the enemy's got us to that place where he convinces us, yeah, you're convicted, and yeah, I see your commitment, but your past record tells me that there's going to be a cycle here where you're going to do well, things are going to be great, you're going to break it only to fail again. So why bother? You see, the enemy is a condemner, a liar. In fact, scripturally, he's the father of all lies. Nothing good comes out of him. And somehow, perhaps, maybe you're there today and you've tried and you've failed. And maybe you've been like me at times when I've prayed that prayer. Lord, if you get me out of this situation, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. I don't know if you've ever prayed that prayer. Lord, just one more time, Lord. Can you just get me out of this situation, Lord? If you would be so kind, God, just to break this thing and threaten me free one more time. I promise you, God, I'll never ever have to pray that prayer again. I don't know, maybe I'm just preaching to myself today, but... Only to find ourselves right back at it again. And when we're going through the cycle time and time and time again, the enemy of change convinces us that this is just who we are. That you're never going to break loose. That you're never going to give up. You're never going to stop. And you're never going to quit. And thing is, you may actually believe what the enemy says to you. You may be high-fiving the devil at night time. Amen. That was lying to you, amen, amen, I believe. You're never going to break free. Oh, no. You're always going to be this way. Yeah, I know. It's just who I am. I keep telling you right now, that's a lie in the pit of hell. That's just who I am. Well, it runs in the family. Hello. Pit of hell. Can I just re rewind just a tiny bit? Oh. <laughs> if you go back to John chapter 8, I'm not going to read it for the sake of time, but I'm going to give you a little bit of homework today. In fact, I'm going to give you a few bits of homework today because how many know we're here to learn? Yeah. Right? We're here to be preached, we're here to have a laugh, we're here to be a joke, but this is serious business. John chapter 8, Jesus is speaking to the disciples and speaking to the Pharisees, and he says, If you, uh, my, my, if you, if you uh, the truth will set you free. The Pharisees come back and say, But we've never been slaves. We've never been slaves. Our father is Abraham. Yeah. We've never been slaves. Well, obviously, this person who said that had a lapse in concentration. Because they had been slaves before. They were slaves in Egypt. Jesus then tells this group of people asking him the question. He then tells them this. What's what he tells them this? He says in verse 41 of chapter 8, you are imitating your real father. In other words, what Jesus says to these people is, you, you, you think freedom is the way your daddy said it was. You think freedom, you think real freedom is what, you're, what, what you were trained up to think it was. And Jesus is saying, listen, you're never going to change with worldly methods. Well, that's just me. It's in my family. No, no, that's what Jesus was saying to them. He said, no, no, no. It's not just not. You can't just get away with the lie and say, well, it was just, it's in my family. It's, it's in my genes. No, no, listen. I'm born again, brother and sister. Those genes, man, they 
estou por mim? But do you know that that inside, I mean, I know your DNA can't change in that sense, but those patterns can break. Yeah. And so to say that, hey, well, that's just the way I'm going to be, that's just who I am, I take it after my dad. I caught myself saying that one time. I caught myself saying that one time. I take, I take this, this certain thing. I've caught myself even standing a certain way, stand a certain way in the kitchen, and I'll have my hand behind the kitchen, and I'll go, I'm just a pig, that's just my, that's my dad right there. And so sometimes we go and grow up. She knows. <laughs> sometimes we go and grow up from how we grew up. You can't expect those worldly methods to get you free spiritually. You can't live by what your father says or your mother says and expect that to set you free. Are they free? You see, the devil has us way of convincing us that we are connected and that we have habits that we're never going to change and we're always going to be this way until the day that we die. You see, if you've ever been there or maybe you're there right now, I want, to, I want us to hang out a little bit. I want to encourage you to hang, a little, hang out a little bit with the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5, 6, 7 and 8. Now, I only read a few verses of chapter 8 because we couldn't, we couldn't read, necessarily read the whole thing because of time. But I want, to make, I want you to make me a promise. Now, you're in the house of the Lord now. I want you to make me a promise you'll go home tonight and you'll read Romans 5, 6, Seven and eight. Because when you go home and read Romans chapters, these are arguably the greatest collection of scripture in the Bible. In Romans chapter 5, we'll, we'll find some prophetic promises. In Romans chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8, we'll find a summary of salvation. In Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, we'll find some concise Christology. Doctrinal things, truths, and salvation of Christ, of freedom that will set us free if we just read it and believe it. You see, in Romans chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8, Paul puts pen to parchment and put a pen to paper and parchment, and he says some things that every believer ought to know. Are you with me? Stay with me right now because these scriptures aren't on the screen because I'm going to read them at rapid style like I'm going to be freestyling these scriptures. Are you ready? Woo. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 and 20 says, Wherever sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Romans 6, 1 and 2 says, Shall we continue to live in sin now that we've experienced Christ? Oh no! How can we who are dead to sin live in sin any longer? Romans 6, 13 and 14. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present your bodies alive to God and your members as instruments to righteousness. For the Lord, for sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under law, but you are under grace. Romans 6 and 23. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is everlasting life. Romans 7, 19. Every time I desire to do good, evil is always present. And the good that I will to do, I know not how to do. But the evil that I will not do, that I do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of death? I thank God to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Romans 8, 1 and 2, there therefore is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 18, the suffering of the present age is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Romans 8, 26, the Spirit helps us in our infirmities, for we know not how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that are hard to understand. Romans 8.28 For we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God. Romans 8.31 Well then, what shall we say? If God be for us, who can be 
against us. Romans 8, 35. What shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Shall tribulation, shall persecution, shall famine, shall nakedness. Romans 8, 37. Yet in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through Jesus who loved us. Romans 8, 38. I am persuaded that neither life nor death nor angels nor principalities shall separate us from the love of God who is in Christ Jesus. I want to encourage you church to hang out with the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5, In these chapters there's testimony, there's scripture, there's truth. There's prophetic promises. There's the source of salvation. There's concise Christology of who he is, of why he came, of what he says is yours. Somebody see the truth will set you free. You see, we get when we begin to read scripture and we read what Paul is saying to us. What is ours was righteously, sorry, what is ours through Christ. When we begin to realize that Christ has set us free. Well, then our life will change. The problem is sometimes 90% of people in church have no idea about these scriptures. And so we're trying to use our old father methods. We're trying to use our old worldly methods. We're trying to use the old things that this said and she said and he said and that one said. But listen, when you're born again in Christ, we need to understand what scripture says about our life not to come, but our life right now. In Romans chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8, Paul is trying to give us testimony that you can change. You know, I want to share three things today that hinder your ability to change. Are you ready? I want to share with you three things today that can hinder your ability to change. If you have a pen and paper, I encourage you to write it down. The biggest lie of the enemy in churches, you'll remember them later. Right. <laughs> Trust me, been there. Paul says this, listen, you can change because Christ has freed you. Watch this. He's freed you, right, from the penalty of sin. I'm going to teach you some content today. Like I said earlier, this isn't just baseless preaching. This isn't just me preaching testimony. This is me preaching the scriptures. And when you apply the scriptures to your life, you're walking the freedom and the power of the scriptures. So what Paul says, because of Christ, that he has freedom, freed us from the penalty of sin, which we find in Romans chapter 8. Being freed from the penalty of sin is what the Bible calls to be justified. To be justified. The word justified means that just as if I never sinned. The moment you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, we become justified. Not just free, not just washed, not just new creations, but we become justified. While we were yet sinners, Christ came and died on the cross to pay the price that you and I could not pay. I came to remind you today for every sin you've done and every sin you can do, will do, and probably, you know, multiple times, Jesus on the cross of Calvary over 2,000 years ago paid it all. He paid it all. But that's why I shout every now and again in church. That's why I got a lot of the Holy Ghost and I sweat a little bit and I baptize in front row and all these different things. That's why I get excited in church. Because I know how much God's forgiven me. I know how much I needed forgiveness. I know how much I needed to be justified. I know how much God had done in my life. When I realized that Jesus paid for me what I could not pay for myself, the Lord paid my sin debt. He paid every sin that I ever did. He paid every sin that I will ever do. He paid your sin debt. But watch this. It gets just a wee bit deeper. Now we can go freely to God. Not just that he paid our sin yet, but now because of that, God sees us as righteous. And because of that righteousness in Christ, we can go into freely into the presence of God. 
Romans chapter 5 says that God demonstrated his love for us, that when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, who were enemies of God, that we might be reconciled to God. So Jesus paid the debt so that you could go back to God. He paid the debt. When you start to think that you pay the debt, when we start to think that it's our good deeds, or even our bad deeds, you know what happens when you owe someone money? I know none of you have ever owed anyone, anybody money in this church. Probably you people have owed you money. But you know what happens when people, but you know what happens when you owe someone money? You give them a wide berth. Right, you stay away from them because you can't pay that debt. And so you see them coming, man, you're like, hey. You see that number come up on your phone and you're like, yeah, I'm rubbing here. <laughs> Why? Because you think you can't pay that debt. So because you think you can't pay that debt, you give them a wide berth and you don't go anywhere near them. It's human nature. When we think we owe someone money or we owe something or we can't pay a debt, we stay away from them. If someone owes us money, they see us come, we walk in a different direction. But I can remind you today that Jesus paid our debt. See, we let us sink in. That Jesus paid our debt upon the cross of Calvary. Yes, we can go before him freely. Yes, we can receive forgiveness. We can walk boldly into the presence of God. <clears throat> Does that mean there won't be any consequences here on earth? Absolutely not. But before God, through the cross of Calvary, we're justified. And here's what the Bible says this. It says that God is faithful. That if we confess our sin, he will cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Which means there's nothing I can do that the Lord won't forget. Come on, that's a good place to see you, man, right there. That's a good place to see you, man. But let me show you how God, how good God is when He forget when He forgives. Are you ready? This is going to blow your mind. The psalmist says, and I showed the scripture on Friday night. The psalmist says that when God forgives you, He takes your sins and He removes them as far as the east is from the west. Now notice the psalmist doesn't say the north to the south. Well, because globally speaking, when you get to the top of north, automatically you start going south again. And so if that was the case, you would always catch your sin up again at some point. Or your sin would catch you up at some point. But the psalmist says this, that God, when he forgives us of our sin, he puts them to the east and the west, that no matter where we go on the globe, no matter where we go, there's always somewhere east you can go and there's always somewhere west you can go. Meaning that your sins once forgiven will never catch up with you. Can I teach the Bible for a little minute? Is that right? And Isaiah, Isaiah says this, I will take your sin and throw it behind my back. He says in Micah, I will throw your sins into the depths of the sea. In Jeremiah, he says, I will take your sins and I will remember them no more. When you put it all together in one sentence, you'll say, I'll remove them as far as the east is from the west. I'll throw them behind my back in the depths of the sea to remember them no more. Some of you almost caught it there. I'm going to say that one more time. He'll remove them as far as the east is from the west. He'll throw them behind his back to the depth of the sea and he will remember them no more. Okay, let me just share with you the, the Mark Penman version of that together. That God will forgive you by taking your sins and throwing them in the sea of forgetfulness and put up a sign that says no fishing. Yeah. I wonder how many times do we go back and fish in the pond? And God's already saved. Sorry, what sin was that? Sorry, what mistake was that? God can't remember. It's not that God is forgetful. It's because God has cast them away. But we have this habit of asking for forgiveness and then sometimes at our weak moments we go back and pick out the fishing rod. 
Can you start building a back here again? But biblically, your sins are forgiven. That's good news. That's good preaching. That's the gospel. Right there. You see, in the body of Christ, when you've been giving your life to Jesus, and you've been washed and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, I want you to go, I've got some more good news for you. You're a new creation in Christ. And I don't know about you, but is there anybody in this place that's grateful that God has took our sin, put them behind his back, threw them into the sea of forgetfulness, and has said, no fishing. Paul also says in Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, that not only am I justified because I'm free from the penalty of sin, but Paul also says that we're free now from the power of sin. These truths, truths that we need to understand to walk in the freedom that God has called. Somebody shout sanctified. sanctified. So first one was that we were justified. Washed in the blood of Jesus, sins were given just as if I'd never sinned. Second thing that will help us in our walk with God and experience freedom in Christ is this, is that to know that we are being sanctified. Amen. These are biblical terms, but these are really important that we understand them. Let me help you in just a little while. Being sanctified doesn't mean that you don't wear jewelry or makeup. Hello, somebody. Being sanctified doesn't mean you say that you go to a certain church in the street or a certain denomination in the street. Just because someone preaches something different doesn't mean they say they're more holy than I am. Because we're all sanctified by the same blood. We're all saved by the same Savior. We may have different expressions. The music may be slightly different. We may have a few lights. I might shout and sweat. I was going to say shout and sweat. I was going to say shout and sweat. I was saying shout and sweat. But just because we may be different, we are saved and sanctified by the same person, Jesus Christ. Sanctification doesn't mean that you dress a certain way or go to a certain church. That doesn't make you holy. I can go to McDonald's every day for a Big Mac, but that doesn't make me a Big Mac. You can be in church all your life, sing songs and do all the rest of it, just, but just being in the presence of church doesn't make you a Christian. I know people that have came to church for 20 or 30 years and they're still the same. Still talking to their neck, still cursing and swearing, still sleeping around, still bad mouthing everybody they can. There's a misunderstanding of sanctification. Are you still with me? Yes. Paul's understanding of sanctification is literally this that the Holy Spirit resides inside of you. And the purpose and primary purpose of the Holy Spirit was this is to push out the sin. That's ingrained in our life. Ooh, this is good preaching right here, man. This is the gospel. If you read Romans chapter, is it chapters again? If you read Romans chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8, I want you to take notice of how many times Paul references the ability of the Spirit to overwhelm the capacity of sin. Ah. What do you mean? I'm going to do something. Why, like, God, it's all you. God, do what you're doing me. God, how come I keep falling? God, it's your fault. Notice in Romans chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8, there's more than 20 verses where Paul uses words like this. You're dead to sin. Sin no longer has dominion over you. You do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. You are under grace. You do not have to live as a slave to sin. Paul uses these terminologies through these verses and Paul understands that not only when you're justified that God puts the Holy Spirit into your life to help you counter and balance and fight the sinful nature and the tendencies that are within you so that we don't have to feel like we're trying to change all by ourselves. That's the Holy Spirit inside of us pushing sin out. That's sanctification, brothers, sisters. That's sanctification. Nothing to do with how tight your jeans are. Nothing to do with how well you sing. Nothing to do with how much money you give to God. Sanctification has nothing to do with outward stuff. Yeah. We change, brothers and sisters, because of the Holy Spirit inside of us. 
working that change out. That's why in Paul in Romans 7 says that when he feels a struggle in his life, he says the evil I don't want to do, I end up doing. What Paul is saying, he's saying even as a Christian, there is still, uh, evil is still present. Sin is still present. What Paul tells us in the scripture is that there's a war going on inside of us. There's a war going on inside of us. And Paul realizes that there's something inside of him that doesn't want to do evil any longer. Yes. It's the Holy Ghost. Amen. It's the Holy Spirit that brings conviction. And here's the good news. If you still feel the conviction of the Holy Ghost, I can not tell you today that God is still in you. And God is still working. And you may not be where you used to be. And you may not be where you want to be. But if the Holy Spirit is still convicting you, He's still working things out. That's a great place to say hallelujah. Listen, if you stop feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you would be what the Bible says, a reprobate and a backslider. Those are people who were once conscious and sensitive to the Spirit of God. But now because they've turned away, they've denied His voice, they've refused His orders and commands and instructions, They've now got to a place where their spirit is so hard, where their spirit is so insensitive to God that they no longer hear Him nor desire to. And the fact that you feel convicted when you do wrong or after you've done wrong, let me say this in a graceful way, is a good sign. It's a sign that the Holy Spirit, watch this, catch this please. When we feel that conviction, it's a sign that the Holy Spirit is struggling inside of us to bring us back to righteousness. When we sense that conviction of God, when we know we've done wrong, we know we've messed up, we know we've done something wrong, and you sense that inside that conviction, you sense the Holy Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit warning you, that's the Holy Spirit fighting for you, that's the Holy Spirit struggling inside of you, trying to push all the sin out, trying to get rid of all the madness, trying to get rid of all the toxicity, trying to get rid of all the negativity, trying to get rid of all the past defeats and failures, and he's trying to remind you, he says, greater is me, this in you, greater is he, that is in you. We have to understand that sanctification is allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us and work through us. My God, I sense the Holy Spirit in this place. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit that brings conviction. That's the Holy Spirit that whispers in your ear. Don't do it. That's the Holy Spirit that whispers don't text that message. <laughs> hey. So Holy Spirit that says delete that email and cancel it so it can never come back to life. That's the Holy Spirit that says don't go near them. Yes. So if you still got that spirit dwelling in you, fighting for you, working in you, I can you tell you today God is very much still alive and still working in your life. It ain't over yet. gift of the Holy Spirit he's given by God to help us fight the flesh well I thought that was my job here's what Paul recognizes in us that when we've been sanctified the Holy Spirit is placed within us but there's a battle going on between my flesh and God's spirit my flesh wants sin my spirit wants righteousness and there's a battle going on and I came to tell you I came to locate the position of the battle and the battle is in your mind so I hear you ask under your breath in the spirit so we're born again pastor and we're filled with the spirit of God pastor how come I still struggle? How come I still have the flesh speaking to me? How can I be saved and still stumble? I can read your mind. I can't believe. How can I be born again and still sin? That's simple. Spirit and our flesh are at war. 
the spirit and the flesh are at war. In fact, watch this. If you tell two brothers, you tell two twin brothers, say, listen, in two weeks' time, we're going to put you in the middle of a boxing ring, and we want the two of you to go scrap, scrap, fight. For one of the brothers, you place them in a training center. You feed them every day steaks, you feed them protein, you feed them all the goodness he's working on for two weeks. And the other brother, you lock in a cupboard and you starve him for two weeks. Then you put the two of them in the middle of a boxing ring. I want to leave it to your imagination. What one do you think is going to win the fight? <laughs> Perhaps that's the problem. Perhaps that's the root of the problem. We have their own understanding. Because the person who's going to win this fight is the person who's strengthened, the person who's been fed, the person who's strengthened their spirit, who's strengthened their body. The person that's going to win this fight is the person who's been fed the best. And so God says this is why we struggle, because we have a tendency, watch this, I'm going to lose some of you right now. We have a tendency to feed the flesh more than the spirit. Yeah. Can you handle the truth? So in the moment of temptation, when the battle begins, when the enemy starts to lie, who's going to win the battle? The one that you fed the most. So in order, watch this, please listen to me, in order to turn around your situation and desire the change that you want to see, we have to learn to strengthen our spirit and weaken our flesh. When the battle begins, the one that's been fed will always outpower the one that's been starved. So God says this is why we struggle, because we have a tendency to feed our flesh and starve our spirit. And in the moment of temptation, our spirit doesn't have a fighting chance in hell. Because our spirit has been weakened and our flesh is strong. So in order to turn it around, I hear you ask, Pastor, what do I have to do? Well, simple. You've got to strengthen our spirit and weaken our flesh. How do we get up, Pastor? Well, thanks for asking. You have to strengthen your spirit with time on your knees. Yeah. You have to strengthen your spirit with time on your word. You have to strengthen our spirit by understanding and recognizing the gifts God given us and working them all out. That's what fasting's all about. Hello. Learning to weaken our flesh. Because I know not, not this church, but I heard a rumor about another church. The 90% of them were good at telling other people no, but couldn't tell themselves no. Someone here I wanted to hear. The reason why you struggle with change is because you thought that if you just dealt with the addiction, everything's going to be great. If you just stop smoking, everything's going to be great. If you just dealt with that thing, if you just dealt with the drinking, if you just dealt with that thing, then everything else will fall into place. But the problem is, is your flesh is so strong. So if you give up one thing, your flesh will desire another. And so now then, to get the victory and to walk in freedom, we've got to learn how to discipline our flesh all the way around. Not just in one area. That means that we need to live a lifestyle of discipline, a lifestyle of fasting and prayer. That's why in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says three things before the Sermon on the Mount, or this was the beginning of it. Jesus says three things. He says this, when you give, when you pray, and when you fast. Why does he say these three things, man? Because these three things deal with the flesh. Your giving deals with your stubborn heart. Hello. Not yours, another church in the road. Fasting deals with our flesh. And prayer strengthens us and connects us back to God. So watch this. If Jesus, our Lord and Savior, tells us what to do, why then do we struggle not to do it? And so we've thought to ourselves, if I just get rid of him, or if I just get rid of her, or if I just stop watching porn, or if I just do this, or if I just do that, if I give up the habit, if I give up this, if I give up that, then everything's going to be alright. But the problem is, and the problem was never the habit. 
The problem was never the addiction. The problem was never the pornography. That's the fruit of the problem. The root of the problem is the flesh that dwells within us. Yeah. As that we live in a church age where we've now became more happy to feed the flesh and starve the spirit. And that's why when temptation comes and trials comes and storms come, that's why we see church members crumble and fall. Because they learn to feed the flesh and not to deny the flesh and to feed the spirit. And so maybe you've given up something and you're thinking, man, I gave it all up but I'm still messed up. Now we've got to get off looking at porn, now we've got to stop drinking, now we've got to do all the things that make our flesh feel good and learn to tell your flesh to know at the time of temptation. But the problem is this, is we need to learn the discipline of saying no. That's what fasting is. People go, why do we need to fast? Because we're disciplining our flesh. If you can't say no to a bar of chocolate, how are you going to say no to a drink? You can't say no to a Big Mac on the way home in a drive through hey. You can't say no to a Big Mac when your flesh is saying just eat it and start again tomorrow. Then is it any, is it, is it, is it any wonder why we can't break free from things? We have to learn the discipline of saying no. And so getting to my last point today, are you still with me? Yeah. I mean, have I, I lost you? Are you still here? Is it making sense? Are you learning some keys that are going to help you to be free? Yeah. These are keys to freedom. Yes. So get my last point today. Because I'm sanctified, I've been delivered from the power of sin. I'm justified. I'm free from the penalty of sin. And then Paul gives us one more reason why we can change. He says we can change because we're justified, free from the penalty. We are sanctified, free from the power. And one day we'll be glorified, free from the presence of sin. Notice what Paul says in Romans 8.18. He says this, as Gary can put up on the screen. The suffering of the present age is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. Here's what Paul's saying, and I want you to get ready to shout, because you know I always give you stuff to think about, but I also give you stuff to shout about. Paul's saying this, when you're going through trials, he's preparing you. When you're going through struggles, he's preparing you. When you feel like giving up, he's preparing you. When the enemy's all over you, he's preparing you. When your sickness is all over you, God is preparing us for glory on the other side of what it is that we're going through. Listen, if you understood that, really, man, you wouldn't just give me a weak amen. Man, you'd be standing on your feet saying, Lord, I thank you for every trial, every situation, everything that I've been facing lately, God. Because, Lord, according, Lord, to Romans 8, 18, God, everything I'm going through, you're preparing me for when you're prepared for me. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Have you understood that, man, that everything we go through, God is preparing us for glory. A glory that's greater than what we're going through right now. Paul says the glory that's coming. And the glory is not just in the here and now. The glory is not where you live. The glory is not what you drive. The glory is not associated with how much bling bling you got. The glory is not associated to your new iPhone bling bling. Listen, I still got an Android that ring rings. Some days we can get caught up in all the material things. All the blessings, all the trappings, the house, the car, the job, the, all these different things, the nice clobber, the nice clothes, all these different things. But Paul's saying, as your God is preparing you, taking you through, he is preparing you for glory. Paul says, get your eyes off of all that stuff. Get your eyes off of what's around you. Focus on me, because I'm the one that's going to refine you. I'm the one that's taking you through. I'm the one that got you out. I'm the one that's taking you through. I'm the one that when you get to the greater glory, and we pop our clogs, and we go to our place, and we enter in, and you breathe your last breath, and you enter death's door, God has prepared another hope for you and me. There's an eternal hope for us, not, not made by human hands. Oh, there's a... Oh, there's a home for us in heaven, not made with human hands. Eternal in the heavens, 
And the Bible tells me that in that place the wicked seem to cease from troubling us. The weary will be at rest and all of God's children will be gathered around the throne room of God singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Listen, you go ahead, forgive me man, but I've got a lot of that old school in me. Listen, let me hear tell you what the Bible says. That when Christ shall come and the trumpet shall sound and the sky shall open, the dead in Christ shall rise and those who remain shall be caught up in the clouds to meet him. I can tell you today, God is preparing you for something that he's prepared for you. <laughs> My God, I'm going to ah, Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. There's an old hymn that used to put it like this. The sky shall unfold, preparing his entrance, and the stars shall see him and shall sing with thunderous utterances. Yes. The sweet light in his eye shall enhance those awaiting, and we shall behold him to this glory on the other side. See, everyone, this is open to us. We can get this, and that's why we can change now, because we know that not only are we justified, not only are we being sanctified, but God, through every trial that we face, is preparing us for a better place of glory. My God, can I, can I preach you like I feel it today? Yeah. Listen, maybe you don't shout in church. Maybe you don't lift up your hands in church. That's fine. But listen, don't you know that when you worship and hear on earth, in the midst of your trial, God is preparing you for 24 hour intercession and worship in the throne room of God. There ain't no sand with your hands folded in glory. There ain't no sin with your hands folded in glory, sin, feeling sorry for yourself in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your season. You say, Lord, I'm lifting my hands because I'm preparing for glory. When we get there to the throne room of God, our heart will be howling. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah, all day long our heart and our voice will be howling. So the next time you're going through some tough times, the next time you're suffering, the next time you're going through a season, listen, you go stand up and give God some praise that he's preparing you, that he's working in you, that the Holy Spirit is still in you, that he's not finished with you, that he's got a plan for your life, that he's faithful to complete that good thing which he started in you. You got to stand up on your feet and bless him and praise him and say, God, every trial, every situation, God, you're working in me. Uh, and I know, Santa Ass, and I know you're, you're looking at your neighbor. You're looking at your neighbor and you're saying, sit down. You're looking at your neighbor and say, shut up. But listen, I came to preach. I came to remind you. I came to remind you of the story of blind Barabbas. That when Jesus was in the house, he sensed his breakthrough. He sensed his breakthrough. He sensed his freedom. And he said, Son of David, have mercy upon me. He sensed his miracle. He raised his voice. And others around him looked up and said, Sit down, Dafty. <laughs> Well, maybe not that. That's the Glasgow version. See, you put me in. What are you getting all worked up for? And Bart was like, Bart was like, the reason I'm shouting is because you don't know what I've been through. The reason I pray so hard is because you don't know what I've been carrying all these years. You don't know how long I've wanted and waited for Jesus to set me free. So excuse me, Mr. Quiet. Excuse me, Mr. Lukewarm. Excuse me, Mr. Dead Spirit. I'm going to raise my voice and I'm going to say, Jesus, do the work in me. Prepare me, Lord. Come on, somebody said, prepare me. For what you prepared for me. See, thank you, Holy Spirit. That I still feel you. That I still hear you. And that you've not given up on me yet. That you're still working in me. A greater glory. That will 
one day I'll be standing in the throne room of heaven singing glory to the Lamb, singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Okay, let me try and land this in <laughs> Hey Amen. Somebody send the staff around and collect all the rubbish and let's go. We're getting, we're getting out of here. <laughs> Remember back in our BC days? Remember when you got an invitation to a party? It's like when my kids get an invitation to the party. They are talking about it day and night. Yeah. Is it time yet? Yeah. Dad, how many sleeps? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Talk to you. You get that invitation. Mm-hmm. And you know you got that invitation, but you, you know you just can't turn up any old house. You know you're going to take time. Mm-hmm. You know you're going to get your hair cut. You, you, you know you men, men, you need to get that trim and that shave and that cut up and that slice up. And we need to do that. You know, man, you, you know that you're going to start getting your clothes ready. You know that you're going to start, you know, looking for finances. Hallelujah. <laughs> I say, you know, you go, you start putting on that hat and music, you start putting on that music that prepares you for the party. Right? You start getting a little, you know, you start getting worked up for the party. In anticipation for the party, in anticipation for the invite, anticipation for the gathering together, you start to anticipate and you start to prepare yourself before the actual event. And listen, I came to remind us today, we've been invited, we've got the greatest invitation ever to the Lamb's Book of Life, to the wedding supper in heaven. And I came to remind someone, your present troubles are nothing compared to the future glory that God has for us. Listen, I need somebody to shout, I'm getting ready for glory. I'm getting ready for what God has in store for me. Listen, you don't have to do what you do any longer. You don't have to be what you've done anymore. Jesus delivered us from the penalty of sin. The Holy Spirit is sanctifying us from the power of sin. And one day, one day, when Jesus comes back and the trumpet sound and the skies open up, we'll be brought into that place of glory. Not only will we be free from the penalty of sin, not only will we be free from the power of sin, but we'll be free from the presence of sin. Somebody say I'm justified. Somebody say I'm sanctified. Somebody say one day I'm going to be glorified. My name is Mark, pastor of this church, and I came to tell you today, change is possible. The truth is set you Just stand to your feet. My God, somebody put the heat on here. The truth will set you free. Truth will set you free. Paul says this in Romans 8. Verse 1. There is therefore no. Not some. Not a tiny man. He said, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can I just tell you this afternoon? The condemnation. And Christianity have no marriage together. Christianity and condemnation are no twin. You see, when you read Romans chapter you'll see some prophetic promises relating to you. When you read Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, you'll see some, you'll see the source of salvation. When you read Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, you'll see some concise Christology, which means that you'll have a right doctrine and understanding of who he is, why he came, and what the benefits are for those who are saved. And I get it, man. Man, I ain't where I am. I ain't where I want to be. 
I started to walk to the tunnel, just ask me, that's the family, man. <laughs> Hello, we are the first up here. I still go back to the town. I ain't the finished article yet. But I tell you, I do know this. But I'm free. Because that's what the Bible says. That sin no longer has dominion over me. But the reason we keep falling and making mistakes is because we have a habit of feeding the flesh more than the spirit. So then how do we rectify it? I hear somebody shout from the back. <laughs> how do we rectify the problem? Feed the spirit. Stop the flesh. How then do you feed the spirit? Time on your knees. Oh God, thank you that I'm justified. Yes. Thank you that the blood of Jesus was enough for me. Yes. Thank you that while I was still a sinner, Christ, you died for me one time. Jesus ain't on a cross anymore. Yes. He's off the cross. He's risen in glory. Yes. He's seeking the principalities high above us. The earth is his footstool. And he said to us right way back in the beginning of Genesis, that we were to have dominion. But do you know what lost dominion? Sin. Caused chaos to generations and generations. But do you know what beat sin? Christ. And in him, today we are a new creation. And no matter what you've done, how many times you've done it, where you are, where you feel you are, I keep to remind you as your pastor today. He loves you. It is irrelevant of what you've done. It is irrelevant of how many times you've done it. It is still irrelevant no matter how many times you probably still will do. The love of the Father is unconditional. You know what I want us to do today is this. Is that two things. If you feel like you're walking in condemnation, you listen to the lies of the enemy. I'm always going to be this way. I'm always going to be this thing. I'm the, it's generational. It's who I am. It's part of me. It's passed down from generation to generation. That's just who I am. That's just who I'll always be. I want to pray for you today. And I want to call it the liar. The second thing I want to do today is this. I want to pray for you. That from today, you'll walk in the truth of the scriptures. And that from today, you'll have a desire to feed the spirit. Put it in its place. You don't mess about with the flesh. You don't open the door, don't start a conversation with it. You give it a slap and you tell it to get back in its cage. I honestly think 90% of the problems <coughs> and issues could be solved. Not by miracles, but by obedience. You know, the people who come to church every week, buy the miracle. Yeah. The miracle. But no, no, no. You just need to be this. I need deliverance. No, 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 you don't. You just need to be obedient. You just need to apply what God's already told you. That's how you walk in freedom. You know, anything through the scriptures today, anything through this preaching today, I know we're coming on to five to five, I know we've been a little bit longer, but I don't know about you, but I've sensed God through it. I've sensed the Lord speak through it. I've sensed God revealing keys of freedom through it. And I never just want to say to God, I'm sorry, God, it's half past four, we're going to just stop the message and go home. Because then I'm not walking in obedience with him.
Father, in Jesus' name. This song is forever. 